uh, to this keynote, Professor Dr. Mark Van Gils, uh, who is a professor of digital healthcare, leading the research group uh, Decision Support for Health at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Technology at Tampere University in Finland. And uh, Mark Van Gils has a 25 year long career in biomedical data analysis, uh, including AI driven patient monitoring research. Um, and uh, working at Eindhoven University in the 90s, then working for a research center in Finland, VTT, um, on taking um, sort of uh, and, and held, holding an adjunct professorship at Aalto University in Finland. It was during your time at VTT uh, and, uh, during which you also participated in the Idea Fast project, which uh, was our, our ways of uh, meeting paths. Um, and I really appreciated your sort of thorough technical understanding and, and proper consideration for the complexities of data science and engineering as it uh, requires considerable um, planning and well-informed approaches in larger scale projects like this IMI2 project, idea fast about multi-device sensing. Um, so I was very excited to see uh, after having learned you moved on uh, to the new position um, at Tampere University that you have quite some um, projects there even um, that are cardio focused um, and cardiovascular disease focused sorry and uh, uh, therefore I was very happy when you responded positively um, to to this invitation uh, to have a keynote um, delivered by you today so um yeah, we're very happy to have you with us. And for the next 20 or 25 minutes or so, uh, the stage is yours. Uh, please, please go ahead and uh, looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you very much, Jan, for the kind invitation. So I will start by sharing the screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, I hope this is working fine so yeah so thank you all uh Jan and and organizing committee for having me here and talk about uh some experiences and and even if this this talk is is, is having cardiovascular diseases in, in the title and and surely I will tell about that but I'm, I'm planning since I have a bit more time I, I, I plan to also give a bit wider perspective on on, on decision support and health and, and what are typical things that, that you might run into. So yes, I'm working at Tampere University in Finland and um, I'm leading the research group decision support for health and my decision support in health care or decision support in wellness, whatever you, we, we take it quite wide, but mainly our, our research groups is, is task is to extract uh information knowledge from all the raw data that we have so we in the previous talk we already saw that it's it's quite easy to do or easy and easy it's it's doable to collect enormous amounts of data and then the question is how can we actually then extract knowledge from it to, that's a big issue there's many practical things but also conceptual things so that's what we work on and of course uh, our background is technical, so we are, are typically people with the engineering background, uh, biomedical signal processing, machine learning uh, from for many years already. And I would say our, our we are not doing, let's say, inventing purely new algorithms, but it's more like we look at the, the things that go, go wrong in healthcare. So that the fact that we have quite often that very heterogeneous data or, or data that is missing or data that is noisy. So how actually can you make robust systems that, that still do something sensible, even if the data is, is not so nice? And of course, as, as a research group, we work together with hospitals mainly, but also with, uh, with medical device industry, uh, major big companies that are, are selling patient monitoring equipment worldwide, but also startups. Um, so in that context, of course, we are, are doing quite many research projects, uh, European projects and national projects. And I will tell a little bit about one project that we just started this year, um, just to give an idea of what we are doing. But, but first, I will basically set the scene a bit about what kind of things that I've been running into over the years and, and uh, basically how with that that kind of knowledge and and, and disappointments and experiences uh, 
yeah, create new proposals and new projects that, that hopefully avoid typical problems. So it's, it's a bit wider presentation than only a project about cardiovascular risk assessment that we have. Um, so decision support, of course, you can ask what kind of decisions. Uh, well, uh, I'm pretty sure in this audience that the people are pretty well aware that what kind of decisions can be made in healthcare settings. So obvious ones are, are kind of diagnosing diseases or, or making risk assessments that things might go wrong um, or screening populations for uh, for uh, the need of, of having more uh, elaborate tests if there's something suspicious or maybe planning of patients' uh, journeys when the patient comes into a hospital or something, some symptom is, is found out or patients who have a disease that you want to manage and follow up um, or maybe fundamental research. So those are the, the type of settings where we have professionals as, as end users, you could say. And then we saw yesterday a lot of uh, interesting presentations about uh, patient contributed data and, and, and having the role of the citizen more involved where, of course, we have more and more that kind of setting where we are dealing with prevention and, and, and motivating people to, to be more active, like we also actually saw today, several examples. So those are, are the typical use cases that we have. And of course, now in the last few years with the, with the hype of AI, uh, basically, you might say, OK, we can solve all those things with, with AI and because we have lots of data and, and we can do everything. So with the, uh, tweet from Eric Topol, who is, of course, a very famous cardiologist in, in the US, who kind of make this type of, of optimistic, hopefully, well, uh, essentially, on purpose, overly optimistic, saying, okay, AI is basically solve, solving everything. And, and you have those wild stories about AI replacing radiologists and AI being better than doctors and, and that kind of things. But I think now, after several years, people are realizing that it's not so easy. AI in healthcare, there's lots of promises, lots of opportunities, but we saw already in the previous talk that in practice, there's many, many things that, that make life a bit complex for us. So maybe we can look at, at that kind of thing. So if we are looking at AI applications in general, um, typically they depend on data as input and they need to learn from uh, given targets, if we are at least if we are talking about supervised learning, so you have data with, with with known outcomes of patients that did in the end develop some kind of disease or did in the end get the, get the cardiac arrest. So you have targets that you say, okay, I want to learn to to avoid people getting getting complex diseases or, or recognize the early symptoms. So there's, there's inputs and outputs that we learn from, and then of course the the whole system has to run into an environment. And this is now a general picture where you could say, okay, we have a setting where we have maybe not yet a healthcare setting, but for example, this could be images in general, and we have uh, targets saying it needs to be classified as a cat or a dog, and it needs to run on some kind of somebody's phone. And so those type of things, as we all know, there's lots of Lots of things happening in image processing, voice recognition, um, uh, finance, travel recommendations, music recommendations. Things are going very fast in, in AI there. But if we look at the, at the healthcare domain, it's actually not going that fast. The things are much slower in uptake. And you might start to wonder because you can just replace that kind of, of data with, with healthcare data and healthcare targets and healthcare environments. But if you look a bit closer, uh, then you will notice that handling healthcare data, uh, it's quite often there's missing data, it's noisy, there's artifacts that, that comes from different people with different devices in different settings measured. So it's it's really difficult to, to have some kind of general data that is, is, is nicely valid for everybody with, with clean data that you can immediately use. So we spent a lot of time on, on, on cleaning data and curating and making sure that it's actually valid. On the other hand, also our targets are quite often not so clear. Maybe we only know after 20 years whether a person actually had a heart attack, yes or no, or if we are maybe recognizing, trying to recognize certain forms of dementia, we only get the final outcome when the person has, has died and we can do pathological research, or if we want to make preventive 
methods uh, that that want to do let's say okay the risk of developing a heart attack 20 years ahead uh, how do you prove actually that that risk is really lessened because it's pretty vague to measure and it's, it's a long-term setting so it's complex to to get labels and to get the right answers different clinicians might have different opinions also about what, what would be the right action to take and then of course healthcare environment you cannot just use data uh, there's there's regulations there's uh, the privacy issues uh, usability issues there's all kinds of things that that make life difficult so these are things that are perhaps not so e uh, relevant if you are making a recommendation for what music to play or what kind of trip to 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 take or or do simple image recognition but they are really slowing down the uptake in, in healthcare and of course we do lots of research everywhere on, on on dealing with those issues because we know that they are difficult we we have people working full time on, on filtering data and and making smart uh, smart analysis and extracting features automatically uh, we have people that are dealing with those complex targets think of reinforcement learning or, or semi-supervised approaches uh, we have people that are working with the environment so helping uh, involving the users from the start uh, standardizations the examples of federated learning that, that were mentioned earlier they can also fit into this block so there's lots of activities there and of course we are advancing but things go go slowly as we know but then you can even think a bit further okay if you are, are advancing with those problems then there are still several issues open so one is you can develop a very nice system but it's not guaranteed that actually people will use it whether it's a professional or, an, or a, a patient there might be usability issues people may not like it they may not trust it it may be unclear why it's actually used so that there's many things open there and if they use it then even then might be a question saying okay well what is the measurable output do we save 1 million euros in per year or do we save uh, 100, uh, 100 lives in a hospital per year or, or are clinicians happier in their work so how do you make that kind of things clear it's not a very difficult thing to capture in, in reality so there's uptake impact are, are actually things that we want to, to develop systems for as an eventual target but they are pretty abstract to actually input into a neural network for example and okay people are developing nevertheless lots of enthusiastically lots of models and, and I, I like to show this picture uh, which is, is from uh, Thomas Mede who is a very uh, famous uh, statistician in, in the Netherlands who is, is very active in decision support method development uh, saying okay do you really want to, to develop a new model because uh, you should maybe think twice whether you really want to develop some cardiovascular disease prediction model because there are already 363 available so all those things in parentheses here are review articles of people that have been looking at what kind of decision support systems are existing for different diseases and it's pretty likely that there is already somebody who has developed a nice model for the things that you want to do so it's actually something that you should be very critical about and if all those models are existing uh, but only few of them are actually running then we could start looking okay what what's the mismatch and you really should think about is it really needed what what's the the, the clinical need that is is addressed there so we know that there are 360 general models 160 specifically for females 80 for sudden cardiac arrest um it's good to remember that that all those models some of them are ai some of them are not ai ai is very trendy but it's good to keep in mind that it's not necessarily the thing that you always need to do and another thing is that of course accuracy measures are nice but there are other things that that really play an important role in, in seeing whether this is useful yes or no and one reason or there are actually quite many reasons why those systems those 306 systems are not used in practice things can go wrong along the line at many places so this type of, of pipeline here which has, has kind of leaks is a, is a nice illustration of why there is lots of things happening in research but quite 
few of them are actually taken into practice. It may very well be that the data that you are using for training is not really relevant. Uh, you are, are just working on something that is, is, is not really representative for what you are looking at. Uh, validation might be on insufficiently on, on limited data sets. There might be all kinds of issues that are slowing enthusiasm of researchers with respect to medical device regulations or, or, or quality controls or how to update models. Um, or people just don't don't use it because they don't like it. They don't have time to, to read all the manuals or it, it just doesn't fit into their workflow. So there's many reasons why things might might go wrong there as well. So questions is how we can assure that actually you are fulfilling a need. Uh, well, I would say it's, it's really from the very start involved both the clinicians and the patients. And, and yesterday we had the, also that, that discussion there about how to involve patients and hearing the patient's voice more. I think that was a very important view there. And then it was actually mentioned also that it's very difficult to find a picture in which a patient was speaking. Here is an example of some patient actually who was speaking to a doctor. But it's it's something that requires lots of effort to to really have people from the very start uh, saying in your development cycle that this is a good idea or this is something that that doesn't really make any sense. Uh, but even if we have a successful system that in theory has a high accuracy and and, and has proven to to work well, then it's still not guaranteed that the adherence by clinicians is also good enough so adherence is typically that we are talking about patients who are not using the system as it should or not doing the measurements at home as they should but actually there's also many reasons why clinicians um, might not want to use a certain system because they have certain attitudes they are used to certain workflows they don't understand why uh, your system even if it says accuracy of 0 0.99 why actually they should use it what's the What's the logic behind it? So there's many things that can go wrong here as well. So that's about the uptake. Um, about the impact is another story that we could have a whole lecture about, but, but let's just go quickly to illustrate that it's very complex. So there's many things that, that we can measure and, and label as impact. And that they are the problem is that there are so many different types of measures that you could think of. They can be clinical, they can have to do with the, the processes, they can have to do with the, the health care staff, how they, they cope with their job, uh, or are they happy with their job, or do we save costs? So there's lots of things that are going on. And, and the problem is then, do we develop a neural network, or do we develop some machine learning method that actually tries to optimize those type of things, and, and which of those things should it be, and how should we measure them? So there's lots of things that are going on. We can measure the patient reported outcomes, quality of life, whether people have been uh, recovered completely, or we can more and more look at the patient reported experience, whether they feel that they have been treated fairly in the hospital, whether the doctor listened to them, whether they had a, uh, whether the, the setting was okay, whether the whole patient journey went fine, which is also something that we can actually optimize for. So the question is, what do we optimize for? And there's lots of things going on in that area as well. And it's, it's an open research area that I would say is, is really deserving lots of attention. And there's, there's international consortia working on, on those things with really needed, needed efforts. Um, but yeah, the question is there, there's really how to prove that something is useful. So this is a nice overview of a bit more than, than a year ago in which people looked at lots of decision support systems for cardiovascular risk. And then the, the kind of negative thing here is saying, OK, we didn't, didn't find any clear clinical benefit from risk factor assessment methods. This now looks a bit too negative. The problem here is that they found is that it's just difficult to prove that there is benefit because there is such a wide heterogeneity in, in the different models, the different studies, the different setups that you cannot really have a large enough N to, to really make statistical numbers because basically every study that is reported is a study by itself with its own properties. So it's it's very difficult to, to group things together and get statistics, which is one of the problems here in this field, I think, the, the lack of standardization and, and people working on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, yeah, so this is a kind of 
you in Finland where we in, uh, looked at, at different hospitals and, and, and interviewed people and asking, okay, what, what makes impact assessment now difficult for you? And the overwhelmingly diff most difficult thing that was identified is, is here that we just don't have enough standardized data that measures impact and, and measures the outcomes in reality. So there's a huge need to do that kind of things. Of course, also other, other things like IT systems and, and, and guidance and that kind of stuff. But I think that the lack of harmonized data is, is perhaps the biggest issue. So we could, looking at all those, those problems and, 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 and negativity, well, things that we could learn is that, okay, clearly, the, uh, if we know that there are already 363 models for cardiovascular risk assessment, we really need to have motivate why we need another one. So, so that kind of thing is, I would say, is the very first thing that you should start, start looking at. And um, then there's lots of complaints about people that, that that do all kinds of weird validations on training sets and and and, and a, a very small data sets and and uh, report not clearly what they actually have been doing. So there's good guidelines nowadays available, and there's no excuse to do not use them. So that's another thing that I would say is really important. Then those uptake and impact measures are are clearly something that we work on because in the end that's what counts and that's what says whether we are successful yes or no and then of course we we need to not work in silos but but spread the word and, and share our experiences so related to that we set out to to make proposals for for new studies in, in which we were addressing certain needs so one example is a project that we just started recently which is era permit project which has again to do with cardiovascular diseases um, and again of course we all know here in this audience that it's a big problem um, but you could argue okay do we really need a new model perhaps we do there's clearly uh, they work the general the current currently used calculators are pretty general they are they don't use, for example, genetic information or lifestyle information like we nowadays have available a lot. Um, gender information is not, not for all those models correctly included. So there's things that we could certainly improve there, and especially those different data sources, including not only the clinical data, but also the, the patient contributed data uh, would really help a lot. So there's, there's lots of opportunities there that we could, could improve models. So that's an example of a project that we are just starting by, by really combining data sources. And we saw that this is not really trivial at all, um, but we are working on it um, harmonizing that, that federated approach is another thing that we are, are looking at. Uh, then of course, signal processing machine learning by itself, especially the explainability mm -hmm. issue is something that we work on. The software solution is another thing, obviously that, that needs to be implemented and then ethical, legal, and societal aspects are, are something that we work on. So this is an example of an of a international project with clinical partners, uh, the Monzino Cardiology Center that basically said, okay, there is a need for this clinical model because we know that there is imperfect uh, performance of current calculators. And we also have quite a lot of data available actually. So Finnish data and Italian data so that we com can compare the different genetic backgrounds. Uh, we have clinical data, uh, we have uh, physiological data via wearables, we have genomics. So the whole idea is that can you combine everything then and develop smarter methods that would help. So here we try to kind of practice what we preach and say, okay, we start by really looking at the needs, otherwise we wouldn't do it. And then having those type of guidelines that are very well published, perhaps a bit cumbersome to follow and sometimes feeling a bit restrictive, but nevertheless, looking at really critically at whether you really have enough data to do something with AI, or whether it's wise to do something simpler, and whether the models really should be extremely complex or whether an understandable simple model might be just as well good enough reporting is really important so that others can reproduce and follow what you have been doing looking at the targets that that should be meaningful and objective and, and think about uptake and impact and then of course sharing of the results 
And that's in a very short nutshell, some background of, of what we have been doing and things that I ran into over the last 10 to 20 years and, and how we plan to, to go ahead with the current project. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And here are some AI generated pictures of filling in ECG and patient and doctor, and you get this type of pictures. Okay, thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to Thank discuss further. A round of virtual applause uh, from, from my side and uh, I hope guess for everyone in the audience as well. I can only try and relay it. Um, that is a very um, interesting talk. Uh, speaking of a, a sort of a rich journey over many years, quite impressive to see that collection of models and then your rightful pointing to the issue of, of uptake. It's not that none of the models get deployed, right? But it, it is seldomly done and it's a big challenge. I appreciated the hands-on uh, pointers and perspectives, like what can we do? It is, of course, um, a challenging way um, to, to, to sort of get in, into practical use, as we know. Um, as we uh, still have quite a few people here, um, please do still consider asking your questions in the Q&A box in writing or raising your hand um, as an attendee. If you'd like uh, to ask a question via voice, um, we can uh, basically allow you in and speak um, to ask your question directly. Um, yeah, so... Um, and uh, Jan, if there are no questions, like in the in the chat currently, I had I want to ask the the, the question. Yes, I, I I couldn't raise my hand because I'm also the host. So sorry for that. Uh, so, uh, Professor Mark, thank you so much for the nice presentation, and I think it really shows the mirror uh, to the community also. Like, where are we going wrong? I think I really like uh, the the point about the, that you mentioned about do we really. Uh, need more models aren't these enough like the right what is the right question to ask now and i think more like many people are, are aware of what are the like what way where we are like uh holding what's holding it up but somehow like what is like, what is keeping it like to make these models into in, in, into the production for example the data is also uh, one of the one of the things like, like models have been trained for, for example in, in the cardiovascular or the a, a arrhythmia detection space that you are quite a, you know expert into in, into that so in that space there have been tons of papers using the same MIT FDB and then like just paper models after models but no no in, in, in practical experience none of them can be used so in, in your experience what is that like uh, uh, what is the thrust basically uh, that would drive them towards the practical use, usability like what is holding holding up? Yeah, so yeah, so of course you can yeah. So it's it's quite easy to to start with MIT database and, and make some some model that does stuff very nice. But I would say in, in practice, the, the project that I've been in and in which I, I've seen that something actually comes out of it is basically they they have been let's say the proposal has been written well with a very heavy influence by by a clinician and ideally even a clinician that says okay i have this and this problem and it needs to be solved and and that person has been from the very start uh, driving the need and then okay you, you as a technical person help to solve the problem and if you have this type of, of champions that say okay this is this is the thing that 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 has a clinical need and they they are willing to then help with, with providing data and collect new data to objectively verify it and then, then it's really it makes it much better case than just saying okay I have some database that I found on the web and 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 do some kind of classification and then some try to sell it to somebody who is, is, is perhaps not yeah try to push it to have that kind of technology push view that that's very difficult to to do and then of course there are there are many many reasons why it's, it's so slow of course that there's the whole regulation type of thing uh, but also the, the whole nature of well of course the data uh, what works in, in one data set from a hospital a doesn't necessarily work for hospital b because they might have in a different country have different types of patients different type of equipment so you the, the validation needs to be very very robust and very wide and that takes a long time to do it seriously 
Uh, then there's a regulation type of things that 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 requires lots of effort to to really make sure that it's a, a medical accepted product or service that you can use. So that there's quite a lot of things that researchers probably don't don't want to do as their main job, and then quite many things that that just lie lying around if there's no company that that wants to to really bring it further. Um, yeah, and then I'll, as I mentioned, it's, it's it may be something that it's it's also quite a healthcare domain is of course quite conservative by by nature. So if there are certain ways of doing things um, in a setting, it's it's very difficult to change people's habits. Saying okay, now you still have to start using this AI system if people have been doing for ten years already some routine that they know very well and that has been working for well. Why should they now suddenly start studying some kind of new new uh, tool that that that's, that unless they really clearly see that this saves time and then this this makes makes my life easier so those there are many things that actually make life difficult but i would say that it's from the very beginning having a, a healthcare professional or, or some stakeholder who really says okay this is my problem and that needs to be solved that that is really a very important thing thank you thank you that's mm -hmm. right um, so yeah, it's a, it's certainly also an area, as you mentioned, uh, there's so much development you brought in these generated pictures, that whole area of AI machine learning is absolutely exploding. And there are some transfers uh, that can be made from, from these domains um, into dealing with healthcare data. Um, I mean, if you think about personalized models, for example, um, yeah, something like... Um, uh, te te techniques that that for example co can go and and consider current context a little bit more closely um could, can have a huge impact um but the the translation is uh, of course um a little bit difficult to keep pace with in 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 healthcare so um do you have any suggestions of what could help the space to get sort of to transition into practice faster than like compared to to what uh, you know some of these areas that are maybe a little bit more consumer facing or even entertainment entertainment or creative oriented uh, you know and, and compared to how fast these areas can afford to move yeah well i would uh, yeah so of course well there are many things that we as, as, as technical people can really influence like like the regulation processes and, and those type of things that, that that just take time but i think for the development Things where we could, well, of course, well, you kind of coined the word already. There are, of course, from technical point of view, there are those those transformer methods that actually are being used now that people learn from cats and dogs and then actually transform them to MRI type of, of recognition systems. So that there's those type of things you can borrow and speed up the technological development. Um, then there's also quite a lot of things happening um, in the field of synthetic data generation so when you don't have actual enough patient data you might be able to generate uh, fake data that is actually not 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 real data but but enough for for really developing at least in the beginning certain certain methods so there's there's uh, mris that, that that are not really true mris but are are credible mris the same for for ecg and eeg signals so there's lots of things there going on and that actually helps also with the, the privacy issues that we cannot really share real data as we saw in the previous lecture but but you can actually share fake data that is not belong to anyone but actually has the similar property so those there's lots of things there going on i would say to to, to help with the development of, of things at the early phases but then in the end you will always run into the problem that that there is the regulations uh, but but i would say speeding up the technical things there but but also of course clearly to avoid disappointments having end users, whether they are professionals or patients or citizens, have them from the start involved. That also really avoids at least that you are doing work for nothing, basically. That, that's... Mm -hmm. It it remains a challenging area, but I think, um, uh, yeah, the inspiration could be taken even more from those other areas to, to try mm -hmm. and speed things up. But some of the large organizations involved, they are certainly also doing that. So I think we will see uh, considerable development moving forward. We have one more brilliant question, which I like to ask, but we have about... 10 seconds for just an intuitive response. Uh, this is Jan Hendrik Sunderkamp asking, what do you see as the bigger problem with evaluating health data? The lack of good and seamless data, as we heard earlier, or the lack of knowledge about impact over time? Hmm. 
Well, I would say, yeah, well, if you really want to look at the big picture, I would say that uh, knowing what is useful in the end. So I would say uh, lack of, of knowledge, what is actually the impact, what is the benefit. And uh, yeah, of course, good data is, is, is missing and it's essential, but it's, it's something that can technically always be fixed if you record more in a sense. But knowing what is the impact is something that, that you cannot speed up if you want to detect whether some whether you reduce the, the mortality over 20 years then you need to wait for 20 years in a sense so that so there's yeah i would say that's a bigger more abstract problem at least i would tend to agree um uh, and thank you for responding to that question in in all brevity and thank you to our audience uh, for asking the questions and engaging we could have a much longer discussion about this of course um but our time um, for the session is coming to an end. So I just um, briefly want to thank again uh, all speakers of the night, uh, including you, Mark, uh, Devendor, Sebastian, and Dieter for your contributions as well. Devendor also for running things behind the scenes quite substantially. Um, just a quick reminder, I've shared this in writing, um, but we are happy to have a a uh, special issue, a uh, research topic launched with Frontiers in Digital Health about su supporting sustainable behavior change and empowerment in ubiquitous and learning health systems, which, uh, Mark, you are also kindly one of the co-editors on. And if you're in the audience, uh, you might find yourself at home with this topic. Uh, please feel free to consider making a submission or sharing it with any colleagues that might fit the bill. And we have one more day to go with the Salzburg Digital Health uh, and Prevention Days 2022 with the uh, Open Innovation and Science Day tomorrow, a full pack program me uh, if you're interested in open innovation and science methods has a little bit of a practical angle a focus perhaps at early career researchers uh, and uh, we will also launch a digital health idea competition about uh, developing innovative concepts together with patients that you can still join and you could still entice uh, any sort of student teams uh, that you might be aware of to consider joining um, there's the, yeah we will match student teams with patient uh, representatives or experts by experience to develop uh, and ideate together and there will be prices to be won uh, at the end of the day uh, so do please consider that um, and that really wraps up the session for today so thank you very much for joining and um, yeah have a good night and uh, perhaps see some of you around tomorrow goodbye